Hello students, Eric Magidson here. All right, so let's jump into chapter two, connecting and communicating online. And today, as you can imagine, everything is going on online, whether you're interacting with an application on your phone, it's most likely talking and communicating online when you're making a phone call, that's happening over our online, over the internet, you're downloading and streaming a Netflix, you're downloading an application, you're uploading videos to YouTube. It's estimated like 400 videos a second or something like that. It's disgusting are uploaded to, to YouTube. So there's content after content. You can find anything you want on the internet. So let's take a look here. We're going to go past these objectives. I would highly suggest you quickly pause, read these objectives. Pause again and read these objectives, but I'm going to go through this material for you. So let's get started. The internet, the big I internet, as you see there, a collection of, is a worldwide collection of networks that connect millions of businesses, government agencies, countries, educational institutions, individuals, you name it. And the devices, by the way, I'm going to show you that here in a little bit. How many devices are now connected over the internet? So. To understand, you know, just some real basic history, some things you should understand about the internet. It originated from a group called ARPANET in September of 1969. Folks, that was even before I was born. Okay, just a few months before I was born, but you get the idea. And the idea was to allow scientists at different physical locations to share information, collaborate, communicate, and work together. So function even if part of the network was uh, disabled or destroyed by a disaster. So this had a military use as well from the aspect of you take down, you know, you, you bomb a radio station, for example, and the primary communication in that region is lost. Well, with the internet and the redundancy of the internet and all these different routes that a single packet that creates a package such as a movie can take over the internet to get from the server where it's being hosted to your computer is immense. And what that means is if one of those devices or one of those cables is cut, you can still get connectivity. A great example of this is in Bend, Oregon. Just a few years ago, we had only one major connection to the internet, fiber optic. And if that connection got cut, it affected businesses in town. I remember going to Safeway to buy some groceries and they couldn't accept my card because it couldn't communicate with servers outside of the region. Well, today, of course, we increase that redundancy. There's many channels of fiber optic coming in and out of Central Oregon. And if one of those cables is cut, all those packets just take a different route. And the more we depend on the internet, the more we're looking for redundancy. So it becomes functional in 1969. By 1984, it had over a thousand computers linked as hosts. So those were computers that could communicate with each other. Now, today, that's a minuscule number. Today, it says, today, millions of hosts connect to the internet. That's ridiculous. And what I mean by that is I actually want to show you the numbers. Let me see if I can find that. Here we go. So ZDNet, pretty reliable source on the internet. Uh, Gartner Group, was it's a research firm, said they slashed its 2020 forecast. But let's look at this. Notice that these numbers here are in millions of units. So when we see here, we're seeing millions. Here, we're seeing billions. So they're saying by 2017, uh, last year, uh, 8.4 billion connected things on the internet and that's going to grow by 2020 we're going to be connecting about 20.5 billion devices over the internet and one of those devices is this one right here this is the raspberry pi this is an entire computer that is about half the size of most of your smartphones and the brand new version on this board is a brand new processor. Let's look here. The Raspberry Fi, uh, Pi Model B plus, um, Raspberry Pi 3 Model B plus. Notice it has a new processor, 64-bit 
quad core. That's four processors, folks, running at 1.4 gigahertz. That, of course, is pretty slow compared to the modern computer, but remember how small this device is. It has built-in wireless. It has power over Ethernet capabilities, so we can just run one uh, cable and power the device, which means we don't have to have a power supply. We can use one of these network interface cards for the network connectivity and the power for the board. This is just amazing, the technology that's built into these computers. And with one of these computers, we can add a camera, create a security camera. We can control a thermostat. There's immense things we can do with these little computers. And by the way, these are whoppingly expensive at 35 bucks a pop. So you could get one of these. You could program it for immense things and create an Internet of Things device that connects to the internet. So again, as we think about this, think about the amazing advances we're making. And when the slide says millions, we're talking billions. So with wired connections, a computer device physically attaches to a cable or a wire. Today, the most common is that wireless connectivity. And I introduced this last, which is Wi-Fi, wireless fidelity. And it allows us to communicate wirelessly Today, laptops no longer come with a wired network interface card. You have to get a dongle or a special attachment if you want to connect it to a wired network. The default is wireless. Your smartphones, wireless. Devices that we're getting, wireless. So today, my television has wireless built in. It connects to my wireless network and it becomes a node on my network so that it itself can download and stream Netflix without a computer connected to it. This stuff is just amazing. So as we look at connecting to the internet, we have an internet service provider that sits right here. They're the ones that give us the connectivity to the big eye internet. That usually happens through a modem, either a broadband modem with a thick cable, okay, or a DSL modem that's using that phone line that still exists in your house come out of the modem. Now, normally, normally what we do here is we come out to a wireless router and that router has ports in the back to where we can connect wired to a computer to keep that connection fast or wireless with a wireless attachment. Now, man, talk about old technology. You wouldn't see this anymore. You wouldn't see these connections with uh, wireless USB because our laptops have the wireless built in. So wired, you know, cable internet, DSL, fiber on premises. So I work with a company that has a dedicated fiber line that gives them much more bandwidth than you could potentially get at home. Our college here has a fiber optic connection. We'll talk about speeds. Wireless uh, gives us that flexibility of wireless connections, including satellite service, by the way. So although rather slow, still we can get internet access through a satellite connection. Now, a lot of you know that if you wanted to, if you're in a place where there's not Wi-Fi available, you can turn your cellular wireless into a wireless hotspot. And you can do that on your phone. You can tether other devices. So your, your phone becomes that wireless router. And you connect your laptop to your phone and you are back connected to the internet. So hotspots are really good for things like construction sites uh, where a construction manager wants to be on site, place an order for materials without having to go to the company, uh, remote connections. Once in a while, just, just our last vacation, we got to a spot where there was no Wi-Fi and my wife got an email she needed to respond to with some things from her computer, fired up her laptop, connected it to her cell phone, sent out the deal, bing, bang, boom, and we're back on vacation. So amazing, the internet connectivity. So the internet service provider, which we've talked about, a business that provides individuals, mostly here in Bend, we have two choices. You know, that's gonna be your uh, CenturyLink well, there's another example of live recording for you. So when we talk about internet service providers, let's just jump out here real quick. I'm going to jump out to the web and I'm going to go to a site called speakeasy.net. Okay. And we're going to look at speed tests. So what this is going to do is it's going to test my internet speed here at the college. So we can take a look at and see what that speed is. 
All right, so I've gone out to the site. I just jumped out there real quick and we're testing my speed. So what we're gonna test is the download speed. That's the speed at which I can download something from a server on the internet or someone else's computer on the internet down to my computer. So that's gonna be the majority of your internet web surfing or utilizing Netflix, okay? Now what it's looking at is the upload speed. So this is the speed at which this video that I'm recording right now, I can upload to YouTube. So as you can see here, okay, first of all, it's gonna give me my routable IP address on the internet, 140.211.25.34. We'll talk more about this in a minute. But I can download at 92.96 megabits and upload at 93. Now, here's the thing. If you do this, and I encourage you to go out and do this on your own computer, you're most likely going to find a higher download speed and a much slower upload speed because the majority of people download from the web more than they upload. But here on campus, we need to do both. Okay. So if you notice when we talk about megabytes or gigabytes and we go back there, we're talking about megabits per second here. Okay. That my speed. So we're not even at gigs yet. Okay. Believe it or not, this is coming and was supposed to be in Central Oregon uh, a year ago, but not quite yet. So Ben Broadband is working on it and we just see our internet speeds get faster. I would highly encourage that you pause this. I'm not gonna talk most, more about this, but you know how things work on the internet. This is a great read. It's in your presentation. Make sure you go through it. Okay, so here's that thing called an IP address, an internet protocol address. And it's a sequence of numbers that uniquely identifies each computer device connected to the internet. Now the problem with this is we're currently using IP version four, mostly. And this limit of addressing is 4.29 billion computers. Okay, 4.29 billion IP address dresses that can be routed over the internet. So you might say, well, Eric, wait a minute. You already told me there's 8 billion devices right now. How does this work? And the way it works is that we do what's called network address translation. Okay, so let me just quickly, I'll go back here and we'll look at this real quick. Let's say that this was our modem connected to the internet. Our modem is gonna get an IP address that can be routed over the internet but maybe behind this modem are hundreds or even thousands of computers that have a unique IP address in this area and all of those computers get translated through what's called network address translation to a single internet address that's shared on the web. So same thing could be happening in data centers. If you go out and say, okay, what is the IP address for connecting, for example, to Google? Okay, so let me bring up what's called a command prompt here real quick. There we are right there, you can see that. And I'm gonna say ping, I'm gonna ask to communicate with www.google.com, okay? So if you notice, I get this IP address back. This is an internet routable IP address. Now we're gonna talk about why we don't use those addresses and why we use www.google.com. And the reason we do that, oh, look, my backup failed. The reason we do that is so we don't have to remember that address. So what's weird is when you come out here, you wanna to connect to Google, you would just type in www.google and get there. But watch this, I can actually use that IP address. Let me bring it back over. Do, 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 do. There's the IP address, 74.125.28.99. 74.125.28.99. Let me get rid of this. So there goes the www.google and watch this. I'm going to hit enter. Boom. I'm still at the Google website. It converted that IP address and took me to Google in addition. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense to you, but I can see what that IP address is on the internet. So let's go back. I want to finish with one more topic here real quick, and that is IPv6. So since we can only connect 4.29 billion IP addresses on that one network, the network of networks called the internet, what did we do? Well, we went to IP version 6. And let me just tell you, IP version six would allow me to give, this is how 
there's two ways I've heard of it. You could give a unique IP address that could be routed over the big eye internet to every single grain of sand on the earth, every single grain of sand on the earth, and still have IP addresses left. The other way I've heard is you can give an IP address to every single atom. So think about all the atoms on the surface of the earth. You could give an IP address to every single atom on the surface of the earth and do that to 100 earths. So that's how many IP addresses. Something tells me we're not gonna run out of those. So finally, a DNS server translates that IP address into a domain name. And the reason we like this, it's basically a table like you would see in Excel that says, here's an IP address and here's the website it goes to. So top level domain, if we type in this IP address, we're gonna get to Google, okay? So that's how we do that is that we can't remember Imagine telling your friend, hey, you got to go check out this Facebook. It's at 74.125.224.72. They'd be like, how am I supposed to remember that? But instead, you just tell them, go to facebook.com, and there you are. All right, that's the first part. We'll be back for more. Take care.